seven years old. She's a bright and spirited girl. She has two brothers, and they like to play together a lot. Mariam has dolls. She has doll houses. She has sewing kits and a kitchen set. Her brothers have robots. They have construction sets. They have very cool cars. They have video games. They like to play together, but Mariam's brothers absolutely refuse to play with any of Mariam's toys, so they always end up playing with their toys. Mariam doesn't mind, though. In fact, she secretly likes it. She gets higher scores than them on the video games. She makes crystals from the science kits and uses it to make earrings and necklaces for herself. She builds higher towers than they do, and her robots can do far more complex things than theirs. She thinks that maybe when she gets older, she would like to have a job where she can build cool things all day long. Everyone tells Mariam, though, that she isn't ladylike enough, that she needs to play with more ladylike games. Mariam totally ignores them and continues to play with her brothers. But as time goes on, she plays with them less and less until eventually she stops playing with them altogether. Now, Mariam is 14 years old. She still gets good marks in her math, science, and computer classes. But Mariam no longer thinks of becoming an engineer, a computer scientist, or anything remotely related to technology. Mariam could have come up with an innovation that could save lives, change the world that we live in today, make great impacts in the area of agriculture, health, education, but Mariam doesn't see a place for herself in technology anymore. So unfortunately, we'll never know the fantastic things that Mariam and other girls like her could have come up with. That is the problem in Nigeria and in many parts of the world today. We're trying to improve lives of our citizens and build up our economies, but we're only playing with half of our team. So, these are my parents. I grew up as the daughter of two engineers. My father was an elect electrical engineer and my mother a civil engineer. And that's one of the issues we have with technology. <laughs> so, my mom was the, uh, the smartest person that I knew. Well, my dad as well, but my mom very smart. She graduated top of her class um, when she studied engineering. She was one of just two women in a class of 100. She was called back after she graduated by her university to start a doctoral program. And she graduated as the first Nigerian woman with a PhD in civil engineering from a Nigerian university. My father, an electrical engineer, he was the ultimate techie. He was always bringing in one device or the other. We would have like a Pac-Man game. I don't know how many of you know Pac-Man. Um, Nintendo Game Boy. Um, we had our very first personal computer with the earliest version of Windows um, installed in it. Then he would gather my siblings and I together so we could ooh and ah over this latest device. He didn't discriminate between his son and his daughters and he would teach us how to use it. I didn't really think much of the way my parents raised me until I was much older, and I realized that the way they had pushed us and loved us and encouraged us had given us wings to fly. Now, I, I was good in maths, and I was, I was shy, I was very quiet, but I was very analytical. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do as a career. But I, I wanted to find my own path in life. I didn't want to study engineering. I didn't want to be the engineer's daughter who became an engineer. So I studied economics because it would use the maths that I liked. So I went on, um, applied for a degree in economics. Oh, I want to pause this. Okay, 
So before I started university, I started, I went to computer school, and that was when I learned how to write programs. I learned how to code. And it was such an eye-opener because for the first time, I could tell a computer what to do, and it was such a thrill. Then I started to get an idea of the power of computers to change our lives. And if you're lucky, make some money too. So after I finished my degree in economics, I went on for a master's in information systems and then a postgraduate certificate in applied sciences. When I was studying, I was also volunteering as well. I volunteered in women's shelters where I was teaching women who had left abusive relationships and marriages how to use computers, basic computer literacy. But I saw how they leveraged their new skills to get um, jobs that they previously did not qualify for. I saw how they were now supporting their families with the money that they were earning. So I saw that technology was truly a bridge with which the disempowered could lift themselves out of poverty and powerlessness. I was very interested in how women in particular could leverage technology. Now, so I, I, was, I was wondering, as I was trying to get more women using um, technology, I realized how few women there were who were actually creating technology. And I wondered why. Women use a lot of technology if they have access to it and they have the time to use it. But a lot of the tools we're using are actually developed by men. The problem starts actually from our education. You find that in Nigeria, the statistics show that of the total number of graduates of engineering and technology each year, only 22% are women. That means that we have only 22% of them going into IT workforce. Now, research also shows that within the first 10 years of working, most of those women, they drop out. They leave the workplace. That means that you have very few women who are actually reaching the top um, in technology companies. So when a girl like Miriam, who we met earlier, looks at the technology landscape, she doesn't see anyone who looks like her. And she feels that there is not a place for me in technology. The research actually backs this up. It shows that up to the age of about 11 to 12, girls are as interested in boys um, in technology, in maths and sciences, but something happens after that. That is when they actually start to take in the messages that society is sending them that technology is not for you. So one thing that I do is I try to attract more girls into technology. I do this by organizing uh, technology camps, residential camps, after school clubs. We found over the years um, about 36% of the girls we've worked with are actually going in for science and technology degrees. I admit that I was hoping to see bigger and faster results, but making change takes time. We found that there are five things that you need to do, I mean, in, um, to make technology more accessible for young girls. Number one, you need to start early. If you want to change mindsets, you need to start early. So we started working with girls who are age 11. But we've since expanded to primary school. You need to make your classes, you need to make them fun and engaging and show girls that they can actually be technology creators, not just users. Find out what they're interested in. When you find out what they're interested in, then you can actually tie that in with technology and let them see how they can, they, they can develop something aligned to their interests. So we had a group of girls, for instance, who created an app to give fashion advice based on different body types. We had another group of girls who created an app to report incidences of rape and sexual violence because that was something that they had personal experiences with. Then the second thing is that Ideally, make the classes or the sessions female only. I know that we don't live in a world that is filled with just women. 
But the research has also shown that for girls, especially girls of a certain age, they feel more comfortable when they're among other girls. And I'm sure a lot of the women can relate. You can make your mistakes, you can ask your questions without worrying about how you look in front of others. The third point is that you need to connect girls with mentors, positive female role models. If a girl like Mariam had looked out and seen a woman working in technology, she could have thought, yeah, this is something for me. This is something that I can do. The fourth point that we realize is that we need to build a community of intelligent, ambitious women who can support each other. And I feel that's also part of what this platform is all about. Because even though there are men and women here, we're a community of people who are supporting each other. We are telling our stories, and we're, we're here to share and help each other in whatever way we can. And same thing with the girls. It's very important. This is particularly crucial because if you want to close a gap, it's not just enough to attract more girls to say, oh, I think I'd like to study technology or computer science. You need to actually keep them in the field. You, they need to stay the course. A woman who is in technology is usually the only woman in her class in her team, in her departments, maybe even in her company. So they need to be able to connect with other women and supportive men so who have had like successful careers so they can see, okay, it's possible, it's doable. I can do this if they can do it too. And then one, um, the fifth strategy that we found out is that uh, it's important to connect girls with work experience so that they can see that what they're learning is not just book knowledge, but is actually solving real problems. This is Sophia. She attended um, a technology camp um, that we organized when she was 13 years old. At the time, she had just a passing interest in technology. But afterwards, she was so fired up that she came, um, returned, and um, she was now teaching girls to design uh, websites, to build games, and create mobile apps. This is Dolakbo. She attended a camp when she was 12, pretty young. She was 12 in this picture. And she also came back and was, uh, she returned to further editions of the camp to teach girls. They both gave back. Today, Dolakbo is studying medicine with a minor in computer science. And Sophia is studying computer science at Lagos State University. I'm Happy that both of them have committed to a career in technology, but they still have a long road ahead. And it's the road ahead that is much harder. If we want to close this gap, lighting that first spark of interest is good, but we need to follow it up by showing girls that they truly do have a place in technology. And we need to hold their hand and support them for as long as they need it. To parents, I would say, don't shower your girls with gifts of dolls and kitchen sets while you let your sons have the very cool gifts of robots and toy cars. You can give your daughters the dolls and the robots. Because if you give her only the dolls and the kitchen sets, what you're telling her is that her future options are limited to cooking, and caring for others. So, this is my daughter, Wami. She's two years old. Anyone who knows her knows that she's bold, she's audacious, she is, she's very, very smart, and she's inquisitive. Those are all good characteristics to do well in technology. Right now, as you can see, she is already a lover of technology. She likes to take my phone and my tablets, but she's still just a user of technology. But you can be sure that knowing what I know and the experiences that I've had, I'm going to encourage her to learn how to code, create, and to build technology. I want Wami, Mariam, and all other girls like her who like to use technology, who are interested maybe in maths and sciences, to keep up that love. And hopefully, in the future, they can join a generation of women who are creating innovation that is changing lives. I would like all of us to work together to build a bridge 
where we can see a future that men and women are working together and are equal players in technology. Thank you.